so just a just a word before you guys get started. Um, I do not expect you to watch the whole thing. Watch it if you want. Um, it's just me rambling about my code and the general structure of my code. Um, yeah, if it's boring, just skip a bit. Um, if it's not, if you want to read it yourself, just watch the next episode where I actually start some coding. <laughs> cool. Hey guys, it's been a long time since I've last made a video. Um, pretty much more than a year. Um, lots of things have changed, but this is the new site, and I think I'm going to start a new series on me just doing some code on the site, so that if anyone wants to give it a shot, um, they can see how I approach problems and how I, and how I, you know, work with the code. So pretty much, um, the front page, you can see the GitHub link at the top here. If you just click on that, you can go straight to the GitHub page, and this is what it looks like. Um, if you're interested, you can read through the README and get yourself acquainted with, you know, the, the prerequisites, how to install, how to set it up. Um, all the instructions are here, and if you have any issues, um, just send me a Discord message or something. But otherwise, um, I'm just going to go over very quickly the files, the folders, what stuff's where, how the general structure is set up, uh, to hopefully give you guys a decent idea of where to start, I guess. So, first off, um, let's go over how to use GitHub. So ob obviously this is my account, this is the name of the repository which is called ProAvalon. We have the code tab which, uh, which has the code. We have the issues tab which has the list of issues. Issues are sort of like just new features or issues or bugs or really anything you want to communicate with the development team with. So for example, Bokobin made one 10 days ago saying go to new table button after after a game is completed, we can take a look into his description and his labels that he's made, uh, or that I have assigned. And you can comment, add code, um, make a new pull request, which we'll get to later in just a moment. And this is what an issue looks like. We can discuss things, and um, you know, if it's not important, someone will close it. And yeah. So if you have any suggestions or ideas, feel free to just make a new issue. Um, you can click a new issue here, and you can. Start off with templates for a bug report, or a feature request, or you can use a regular issue. So they're just simply simple templates, like this is the bug report one, uh, you can just fill it in. Otherwise, a regular issue will give you a blank template. So the next tab is pull request. Um, the pull requests are pieces of code that you've written that you want to merge into the main branch. So GitHub has this awesome, well, Git, has this awesome way of code collaboration where you have one branch, so one branch, and if you make a new branch, you branch off the tree uh, to make other features so that your features or your code does not affect the main branch or the master branch. And you can see the master branch here and I've deleted the other branches, but pretty much a pull request merges in a new branch of your code, in other words, one new feature, um, and we can go over the the, the code, we can review it, and if we like it, we can then merge it. So for example, this one is Bokoben's pull request, which is incomplete. Um, he's had some code, I've given a review, um, and he's going to work on it. <laughs> when he finishes it, I can then merge the pull request over here, but um, I haven't approved the changes just yet. And obviously there's a bunch of closed ones here, which I've merged in or closed, and yeah, it's pretty cool. The projects tab is not too important, um, I haven't been using it much, it's sort of like a Trello board if you know about that. You just have one board and you can move different issues throughout the um, the um, the project board I guess. So you start from to do, things we've decided to do, um, we can then track progress, we can put it for review or a pull request, and then they can be assigned to done. But I haven't been using it too much. The wiki tab we haven't set up at all, if you want to help set it up sh feel free. The insights tab just um, gives you some insights to the site, see who's made what changes, you can see code frequency, commits, and stuff like that. So red is deletions, green is additions. Um, the settings is my side, yeah. And so let's take a quick look at the folders and the files. So the main file starts from app.js, which if we open up, shows this. It's pretty much just the initialization. You won't be needing to touch this. Um, this is just setting it all up. If you're interested, I guess you could take a look. 
then we have, I guess the next logical step would be the sockets file. So under the sockets folder, there's sockets.js. Whenever someone logs into the server, they get redirected to the lobby page, proavalon.com slash lobby. And when they connect to lobby, they automatically open a new socket, which is like a, a port, I guess, um, to the server, and this sockets file handles it. So a lot of this is set up and work for the recovery of games after a server restart. But if you scroll down a bit more, you can see the actions object. This is all the commands. All the commands are stored into here. And we could actually separate this out into a new file, which, to be honest, should be done. <laughs> Um, because this is a quite a massive chunk of the code. Um, maybe I'll get around to that soon. But mainly the user commands like help, they generally fo follow a template. So there's a command name, it's an object, there's a command name, so it is called help. Um, the help then, oh, the, the help property is the text to show when someone does slash help. And run uh, will be ran if the someone runs slash help and this will actually just add on every single command's help text and return it back to the user. So here we can return data, data to return and that will be sent back to the user. Some asynchronous functions, for example, um, get muted players. So let's just find out get muted players. Because get muted players has to check the database, it's not synchronous. In other words, um, so synchronous is line by line, step at a time. Once you do this, then you do that, then you do that, then you do that, and then you return. Asynchronous is, okay, you start work on that while I go do something else, and while you do that, when you're done, then come back to me, and then remind me, and then run the code. That's what asynchronous is sort of like. And because all the database queries are asynchronous, um, we cannot send the data straight back like we did return data to return, and instead we have to send a message to the socket. So individual person communication can be done with socket.emit. So you can see here we have a sender socket which is passed through the run function and we dot emit, we give it the type of data um, or the command message that's assigned to it and then the data to return here. So that's how it works. And this is very simply get the username, check if they've muted players, if they do add the muted players, add all of them and then return it. And that's how they see it. So there are a bunch of other options, you can read through them later if you're interested. Then you have the mod commands, which are for moderators, um, all moderator stuff. Then of course you have admin commands, which is just for me, or another admin if I ever add one in the future. And here we go, these are just you know storing into the variables. So this bit of code loads up mod actions, for example if someone's muted, um, it will make sure they're muted and they can't do anything. That just loads it up from the database. And this is the main chunk of the sockets. So IO is the socket um, global, I guess, object where if you want to emit a message to everyone, you would do io.emit or io.send or something. That's what IO does. So io.sockets.on, so whenever there's a socket connection, uh, it'll run this function and all the stuff it does isn't here. So if they're authenticated, that's fine. Otherwise, you're not authenticated and just return and you know they won't be able to connect because this return simply terminates this function. And then this bit removes duplicate sockets. So you, know, you, re you guys really don't need to know the nitty gritty of this, but pretty much it's just handling sockets. So if I log in through one device and I log in through another, my previous one gets disconnected and stuff like that. And we add it to all sockets. And then after a certain time, just does some stuff, sends, some, sends the, the commands out to the users. Um, don't worry about that too much. We check, we s tell them to check the reset date, we give it the date, we check the up new update, and we ask them to check the new player show intro in case they're the new player. And then we send to them the game modes. We find the player, we find if they're muted, or rather we get the person's muted players and we update their client side. So that those are private mutes, not global mutes. Global mutes can only be assigned by moderators. And then into all chat, you know, so this is an example of how we would send to all chat. Socket.join.orchat. So this will add that person to the all chat. And then in the data, you sh this is how I've set it up. We have a message property, which is the actual message to display. And we have a class string, which um, gives it the color and, you know, the type of, you know, text to, to show it as. 
uh, and, and, in the, and in this case, um, it's teal, it's server text. And I have a function here called send to all chat, which passes in IO, which is the global object function for sockets, and the data. We also have here io.in all chat. This updates the current playlist. So if we log in very quickly, we can see on the right side here, online players. This is being updated in that piece of code, which is here, update current playlist. And we get all the players' username from the sockets and the functions down below. On the disconnect, you know, disconnect them if they're in a room, check the room's empty. If it's empty, then remove, stuff like that. Mod actions, um, that's the sockets file. Cool. The next important one, I guess, would be gameplay. So under gameplay, you have games and rooms. So if you guys are really contributing any code to gameplay, um, you would be working with this folder. Inside room, this sets up um, the game modes that are available, players joining, players leaving, um, you know, what players can do. The claim is also here because you can claim before a game starts. Um, you kick players, stuff like that, send text. Okay, and players, this is what this one does. And then on top of that, we have the game file. The game file inherits the room, so you can see the game is here, and we do a room.call. This will inherit all the properties from the room, and later on, because we need the object, the functions as well, we also have here game.prototype equals object.create room.prototype. So all the room functions are also assigned into this game. So that's how this JavaScript inheritance thing is set up. Um, for the game, it's very simple, just the game logic really, a five place minimum, these are the alliances of each player, I guess. I'm not sure if this is necessary anymore, because I've changed it a bit, um, but I don't think it's being used right now. The number of players permission, and you can see some of the comments of how I've set this out. So for example, the phase, you have player picking, you have interaction team votes, you have mission votes, and you have game finish. And of course, there's other branches, and you know, assassination phase, you have lady of the late carding phase, and stuff like that, miscellaneous phases here, I have these. <coughs> This is just the planning, and these are all the properties of the room, and this is the recovery and game bit. This was a pain <laughs> to, to set up and make sure it's working. Pretty much it gets the stored data, which is JSONified, um, which is pretty much encoded into a string, and it reloads that into a new object and sets all the properties to make sure it's the same as the previous one. And these are the method overrides. So inside a room, the room file, there was also a player join room, but the game, we also need to do some other checks. So for example, um, in the room, if the player joins, add them to the soccer, display them, and show it to everyone else. But in a game, we need to check if the game is started. If the game is started, we also need to send to them the gameplay data. You know, out of what role they were, if they're spy, what other spies are visible, stuff like that. And so we have to override it. And so game.prototype.playerJoinRoom is the override. And at the very end, we do also call the room player join room so that they're also still added. Um, you know, and they're still displayed. Play join room, play join room. So that's how this works. <coughs> this is the inheritance system that's set up. Um, the play sit down, for example, is another override. Play stand up is another override. You know, if, if the game is started, um, there has to be a couple more checks. Now this is the start game. This is a pretty chunky piece of code. Um, pretty much it just runs through the startup phase of the game. Um, I've commented most of it, so it should be not too hard to read through it if you need to. This is the bot section. So if you're interested in improving the bot, this is where you'd look at. So currently, um, at the end of the start game phase, or start game function, we initialize checkbot moves. Inside checkbot moves, what it does is, it continuously checks every second, I think, time each loop, it checks once a second if there's any valid move that the bot can do. If there is, it'll do something. If there's not, then don't do it. And at the end of the game, or if the game is left, it'll stop the, the constant checking to free up the memory and return back to the system. So yeah, as, as, as you can see here, if the room is finished, if it's true, then clear the interval, and this interval is now undefined. So it'll stop checking. Um, there's lots of comments here, which I haven't commented out, because usually you don't see this, but I guess I can comment that out later for debugging, really. Uh, yeah, so pretty much we get the buttons, we get the number of targets, we get the prohibited indexes, which are, for example, if you're an assassin, you can't shoot a spy. So those indexes will be on um, on this array list. Um, can't hit green, can't hit red, um, stuff like that, and it will just play moves. And it just does that. 
um, once every second for all the bots. Now, this is the game move section. So every single move, for example, picking a team, approving or rejecting, mission voting, assassination, all of these are game moves. Anytime you have to press a green or a red button is considered a game move. Every game move will save the new state of the game and also it'll run through this function. So what it'll do is it'll check the common phases. So every single phase has an associated game move function, which you can see here. So common phases dot game move. And if it's the current phase, so if it's picking team and we have a game move coming in, we expect it to be a team that's picked. So the socket is the player who's who's requested the team and we pass it in the data, which in this case would be an array of usernames that would be on the team. So for example, pronub and whatever other names you have on, on the team that you selected. If we're in common phase, so if this dot common phases has own property of this dot phase, so if the current phase is within common phases, it's true. And if the common phases has the function game move, then run it. Okay. And then we have the special phases, for example, assassination and lady of the lake. And then finally, else this should not happen because um, every single phase should have an associated game move. And this will send it out to everyone publicly because it's this dot send text which sends it to all sockets and a message and the gameplay text, the, the class string. And I've added a code one so people can reference it to me later if it ever happens. Then, at the end of all this, we check for special moves. For example, um, at the end of mission voting, for example, so that would be under common phases, mission voting is a common phase. Um, if, so if the game is finished, for example, there are three successes, um, and it usually goes straight to finishing the game. So it run, you know, finish, finish game. I think is a function. Yeah. So here's the finish game function. But um, before that, um, where was I? Game move. But before that, it'll run a special check saying if the so it'll go through every single role and every single card, and if one of them has. Um, a special new phase, for example, assassination, then it'll jump into that phase. So that's how it sort of works. And then at the end, distribute the game data again to show everyone what's happened. Two show guns. Um, once again, every single phase has a couple things in it, which I'll, I'll, get, I'll get to this later. Don't worry about that. These are all phase specific stuff. Get status messages as well, prohibit in discus, and this is the game phase functions end. These are just some miscellaneous ones. Distribute game data is fairly important, but you won't need to touch that unless you have some really game-changing feature. This is the game game data which is sent out to every single player. Um, every single player gets an up gets a an, a, an updated version of this uh, whenever something's made. And you know these are all kilobytes worth of I mean, bytes worth of data, so it doesn't really use up any bandwidth at all. It's not like I'm sending a, a, an image or a video. You know, it's just plain old JSON. <laughs> Um, get game data for spectators, so this is the spectator data. Add to chat history, only added to chat history if the game has started because we don't record it before the game started. And this bit of text I haven't removed yet, if the message has phase in it, it'll display the current phase. So I don't think anyone's picked up on it because uh, no one's messaged me just yet, but literally if you type phase into any single room, for example, if I do this, actually I'm not sure because the game hasn't started. Oh, we do have it, the current game, the current phase is picking team. Um, you can see that. Now, uh, get status for the front page, a finish game, as you guys have seen, that's all that. Check special card moves, run it through all the roles, run through all the cards, and if we found something, return true. Simple. And this um, public data is, for example, who holds the card, um, where the assassin shot, you know, who the assassin shot, sorry, so to display the, the bullet, right? Um, this is in public game data. And these will all be um, inside their own respective role or card file, which we'll explain later. Vote history stuff, and these are just helper functions. So there's Avalon. So inside here, there are three folders. Common faces is ignored. Any other folder would be considered a game, a game mode. So in this case, we have an Avalon game mode and a Hunter game mode. The Hunter is only is pretty empty right now. It only has one resistance chief, um, but I'll fill that in later. We have the Avalon folder here, and so inside each game mode, there should be these three files. 
index cards, index faces, index roles. You don't really know, need to know how it works. It pretty much just finds all the files and imports them in. And this is run within the room.js file. Now, what's important is actually what's in these folders. So if we go into roles, for example, let's take a look at Assassin. Every single role will have a certain number of properties. Let's take a look at the template first. There's a template.txt. There is always a name of the role. There's always a special phase, if there is a special phase. There's a role. This is required, the role of the, of the new role you're making. There are alliance, a resistance, or a spy. A description to display what they are or just the description. This one, you don't have to worry about too much. This is the order in which they appear for the role settings inside the menu. The host sees it when they click on the little cog. Um, the order at which, so if it's first, or if it's second, or if it's third, you know. Um, in this case, assassin has, oh, this dot player shot. This shouldn't be in the template because the, I copied it from assassin. Uh, this is an assassin specific property. Mm, you don't need this in all of them. And this dot C, this is a, a required function. This one returns an object of what the player sees. So for example, Merlin sees all the spies, Percival sees Merlin Morgana. Um, you can open up Merlin and Assassin's or a spy's um, you know, file to check how I've structured that. Then many of the roles, they have to have a check special move if they have a phase to go into, for example, Assassination. Um, you need to check if the Assassination phase we need to jump into. And get public game data, it's not absolutely necessary, but yeah, so this is the template for this. Very simple. So the assassin one has, for example, assassination as a special phase. It's C is if the game has started, create an object, create an array. Don't add Oberon and add in all the spies. So for every single player in the game, if they're aligned to spy and if they're not Oberon, then we can add them to array. And object.spies is equal to the array, return object. The assassination phase is this check special move. If the player is not shot yet, so if it's empty, and if the game is finished, and there were three successes, then we go into a special phase. Otherwise, return false. And get public game data. If there is now a player shot, so for example, if player shot is no longer empty, then return assassin shot username is equal to this dot player shot, which would be the index, or as the username, the username of the person shot. Otherwise, return null, and return assassin. So that's pretty much that. Uh, the phases and the card is pretty self-explanatory as well. It's pretty simple. Uh, it's pretty much the same. So, for example, if we go into Lady of the Lake, um, you guys can read this yourself, but there's also a template for this. You have a game move, which means that if someone cards, uh, what actually happens. The important bit is here, var alliance is equal to that, so grab the target's alliance, and emit to the carder, so the socket is the person who carded. Um, this person, target username, is a spiral resistance. That's the main bit. Update the location, send it to everyone else saying that someone carded that person, and then update the phase back to picking team. Otherwise, you do not hold the card if the person is, isn't holding the card. Um, button settings. So every phase has a couple of things which I mentioned earlier. Here's a summary. They should all have a name. They should have whether to show the guns or not. For example, in assassination, you want to show the guns, but in picking team, you don't because you're picking a team. Um, so they shouldn't show the guns there. They should also have a game move to perform the operations when you click a button. For example, you card someone or you pick a team, that would be a game move. The buttons that are visible or not, for example, um, is the green button visible? Is the red button visible? If it is, is it disabled or is it hidden? Or is it, you know, uh, what text does it say? Does it say pick? Does it say shoot? You know, um, that's also done in this file. The number of targets allowed to be selected. Um, which is, for example, Lady of the Lake, you can only select one person. If you're picking a mission and it's six player and it's mission one, you can only pick two people, um, stuff like that. Status message to display in the gray box in the center, for example, waiting for blah, blah, blah to card someone or use the Lady of the Lake or someone. And prohibited indexes, for example, um, a spy cannot shoot their spy mates. You know. So these will be the prohibited indexes. So for the Lady of the Lake's case, the prohibited indexes would be the previous people who were already who had already held the card. So you can see that very clearly with prohibited indexes to pick. Lady history is equal to this is this object's oh this dot th because this is a phase file. We need to access the cards object. We go this dot this room because um, the lady holds a reference to the room dot special cards. And then the card in lowercase to refer to the object, and we grab the history from it, and we return that history. 
So the history is a list of indexes of people who's held the card, and those are the prohibited indexes that you, that you can pick. You know. um, this is the status message, choose a play to use the later leg, blah, blah, blah. Number of targets and the buttons. You can read that in your own time to see how that works. How long have we been going for? Oh, this has been going on for 25 minutes already. <laughs> I did not expect it to be this long. Anyways, we'll quickly wrap this up. Um, what else is important is the routes, I guess. The routes will be important for forum stuff. Forum index profile and statistics. The forum will have a new folder called reply routes reply, you know, and stuff like that in databases. Um, the databases and the models are all in this models file folder. So every single type of database object is stored here. So for example, you can see, um, let's look at a game record. This is a fairly interesting one. Lots of people will be looking at. Every single game record will have Oh, sorry for that loud buzz. Someone just joined the room. Um, back to it. The next bit that's important is also oh, sorry. Back to this. We have the time started, which is the date, the time assassination started, time finished. This is pretty much all just for statistics. You know, what game mode it was, number of players, how the game was won, who the assassin shot, the lady chain, the sire chain, mission history, vote history, player roles, more than one fails. You know, if it's true or false, and that's how this works. It's a mongoose thing. You guys can search it up if you want. Now, the uh, last bit I want to talk about is the client side. And this is all done in views and assets. So in the views folder, we have all of the different pages. And these are all EJS files. For, so for example, let's take a look at, or let's take a look at the log.ejs file. So the log is not too interesting. It's just an HTML and CSS file of what to show. Um, something more interesting like lobby.ejs will include partials, uh, the header, the current stuff, the boxes, you know, the gun images, all this stuff. Now the JavaScript stuff and CSS files, if it's not in that in the EJS file, is in style sheets, which is the, the CSS files and the scripts file folder. The scripts holds all the JavaScript. And so lobby9.js is a big one. Um, inside the lobby, we have another lobby folder, which has the, the broken down stuff. Inside sockets, we have a bunch of other stuff as well. Um, that's just sort of how I've tried to split it up. So lobby9.js, um, as you can see, the very first thing is connect to the server using a socket. Um, I'm still working on reconnecting attempts, but we'll take a look at that later. The own username, um, grab own username, buttons, you know, and this is just all the JavaScript for it. The interesting one is the draw function. So we can take a look at the draw function. Um, if we have data, highlight the, the avatars, draw them, position the avatars, draw the team leader, draw the middle boxes, scale the middle boxes, draw claiming players, draw the guns. You know, it's a load of rendering and drawing, but, but yeah, <laughs> lots of hard work. You guys probably won't need to touch that. Um, this is the forum bit. So inside the forum, if we're going back, replace it with a slash forum to always go back. If you're adding a comment, blah, 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 blah. Reply anchor links. This starts the the um, the nice interface you have for forums. This is the liking section as well. Attach likes to the Ajax request. So I think that pretty much sums it up. Um, there's still a fair amount. Well, there's not too much left into it, but... Um, yeah, I didn't really expect all you guys to stay and watch the whole thing, but if you did, good on to you. <laughs> okay, next episode will be about some actual code. Catch you later. Bye.